Our keynote speaker uh, tonight is Dr. Don Thomas. As I mentioned earlier, we've got two astronauts. Bob Springer will be spending a couple hours with you on Thursday. Uh, he lives part, part of the year here in Huntsville. So he'll be here Thursday for, uh, to talk with you and to be for your, with you for your graduation Thursday evening and Friday uh, for, for our youth programs. But Dr. Don Thomas is a native of Cleveland, Ohio, a science guy who also happens to be an engineer, a pilot, and one of NASA's most accomplished space explorers. After earning a degree in physics from Case Western Reserve University, Dr. Thomas continues education, earning a master's and a PhD in material science and engineering from Cornell University. Dr. Thomas spent seven years at Bell Labs in New Jersey before mo moving to Houston, Texas to work as a materials engineer at NASA's Johnson Space Center. It was in 1990 that Do NASA selected Do Dr. Thomas to be an astronaut. He's a veteran of four space flights, three aboard Columbia, and the fourth above Discovery. During his missions, Dr. Thomas conducted hundreds of life science and materials research experiments. In addition to his flight time, he served as NASA's Director of Operations at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, Russia. Dr. Thomas is a private pilot with time in both single engine, land aircraft, and gliders, and of course, accumulated lots of flight time as a mission specialist in NASA's T-38. His total time and distance in space over 1,000 hours, which is about 43 days, or 11.3 million miles, and almost 700 orbits of the Earth. Today, Dr. Thomas is the director uh, at Towson University's Hackerman Academy of Mathematics and Science, working to encourage student interest in science, technology, engineering, and math. He is also an author, releasing Orbit of Discovery this past year. Please help me uh, welcome one of NASA's most accomplished space explorers, Dr. Don Thomas. Thank you very much. Hey, it's a great honor for me to be here tonight, and, and I must say I was a little intimidated, you know, walking over here tonight to be coming to such a distinguished uh, group of teachers. You guys represent the best of the best of all teachers across the United States and around the world. I was a little intimidated until I turned the corner here and I saw all the outfits and the costumes and, and you're making a little bit eas easier on me tonight, so I appreciate that. But I'm still a little bit nervous about you being back there grading my presentation here tonight. Well, congratulations to all of you here. I know how much hard work and dedication that you've put into your careers. And I can't tell you how much I admire teachers like yourselves for all you do. You're always seeking out new professional development programs, gaining new knowledge, working to be the best teachers possible. And the fact that you're here during this special week of International Space Camp, that says a lot about your character. So are you guys ready to have some fun this week? Yeah. Well, I know for a fact you're in for a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And besides all you're going to learn this week, you will make many new friends, and you're going to share ideas and experiences with each other. And I think this is what really sets teachers apart from other professions. That's your willingness to share your ideas with others for the betterment of education, for the betterment of your students. As Mike pointed out, tomorrow is the 45th anniversary of our first landing on the moon by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And I got to tell you, you can't not pick a better place on earth to celebrate this amazing achievement than here in Huntsville, Alabama, which is you know, the home of the Saturn V rocket. So you guys are up for a great week here. I was only 14 years old back in July of 1969, and I still vividly remember watching every minute of, of the landing that you know, afternoon. And after a two and a half hour moonwalk was over and both astronauts were safely inside the lunar module, I remember walking outside that night in the early hours of the morning and just staring up at the moon. And I couldn't believe that there were two humans up there walking around on its surface so far from home. It just made me want to join them and journey there myself one day. While I was 14 at the time, my interest in space and my desire to become an astronaut uh, started many years before Apollo 11. It started on May 5, 1961. And on that day, the United States launched the first American into space using a Redstone rocket that was again developed right here in Huntsville. I was in kindergarten at my elementary school. They marched us all down to the gymnasium in single file, of manner to watch the launch on a small black and white TV that day. 
I remember watching the launch with great excitement, and as soon as it was over, I said to myself, I want to do that. So from a very young age, I knew I wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, I wanted to float in space, ex experience zero gravity. I wanted to see beautiful sunrises and sunsets with my own eyes from space. I'm not sure what, which teacher or administrator had the idea to have us watch the launch that day uh, on the TV at, in my gymnasium. I wish I knew their name so I could thank them and give them a big hug because they forever changed my life and the course of my career. I've heard it said that uh, every student has a switch uh, th that you turn and you can turn them on and that's the role of the educator to find that switch and to flip it. Well, I gotta tell you, watching that first American launch into space definitely flipped the switch for me. I was gonna be an astronaut. I had no idea how to become an astronaut. We didn't have space camp. That's how old I am uh, back then. But I knew the competition was going to be tough for these positions. So I set out from a young age to always try to do my best, and I worked hard in school. Uh, after high school, I went and attended Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, where I grew up, and got my bachelor's degree in physics. And that's the minimum degree you need to become an astronaut, a four-year college degree in math, science, engineering, and the medical field. But again, I knew the competition was going to be tough for the mission specialist astronauts. So I couldn't go in there with just the minimum requirements, and I decided to go on, and I got my master's and doctorate in engineering from Cornell. I graduated from college in 1982, which was very close to the beginning of the space shuttle prog program, so my timing couldn't have been better for myself. NASA selects ast new astronauts every two to three years, and they'll pick a small group of 10, 15, or 20, depending on their needs. And two years after finishing college, NASA announced that they were looking for new astronauts. I excitedly wrote to NASA for an application, filled it in, sent it in back to them, and I just sat back and waited to hear whether I made it or not. I never heard anything from NASA. About three, four months later, I was reading the New York Times, and there was a little article in there, and the headline said, NASA selects 15 new astronauts. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. They didn't call me. And I quickly read the article, and my name wasn't on the list. And that's when I realized this was going to be a lot harder than I ever imagined. I didn't give up. I decided to try again. And two years later, there was another astronaut selection, sent my application in. This time, I heard back from NASA. I got a postcard. It said, dear sir and or madam, thank you very much for your interest. We had a lot of good candidates. We didn't select you, but good luck in the future. And I looked at that little postcard, and I thought, you know, my grandmother and I have the same chance of getting selected. It was zero, right? And I decided I need to do more to get noticed by NASA out there. So I looked into the backgrounds of the people that they did select. They turned me down twice, but I looked into the backgrounds of the people they made it, and there were a few clues there for me. Most of the civilians that they selected had some flying experience. So I decided, well, i got to get my pilot's license, and I did that and got my instrument rating. Most of the astronauts they selected had some skydiving experience, so I learned how to parachute. I taught a university course. This is something NASA seemed to like. It wasn't a requirement, but again, it seemed to help a little bit. So I tried to do all these things, and then a few years later, another astronaut selection sent my application in. And this year, uh, NASA called me up and invited me to Houston for a week of medical tests and an interview. And out of the thousands of people that apply from across the country, NASA will whittle it down to 100 they bring you to Houston, you spend a full week there on medical tests, and then there's a one-hour interview, and then based on that, they select their astronauts. So the medical test went well. I thought the interview went really well. I went back to my job in New Jersey where I was working at the time and uh, just sat back and waited to hear whether I'd made it or not. I was really hopeful you know, that I'd gotten in. But I got a call about uh, two months later, and they said, Don, thank you very much for applying. We had a lot of good candidates. We didn't select you, but good luck in the future. And after being rejected three times, there was a really strong message for me from NASA, right? We don't want you. And I decided I got to do something else with my career. I gave it my best shot. I really had worked hard. Um, I wasn't going to make it. So I decided I have to move on. So I thought I'll go to bed and I'll get up tomorrow morning with my mind fresh and I'll put together a new plan for my career. Well, I went to bed, got up the next morning, and the first thought that popped into my head was, I still want to be an astronaut. So I asked myself, is there any more of these little things I could do to increase my chances? And by looking at the numbers again, most of the civilians they selected were already working at one of the NASA centers. And that's when I, I quit my job in New Jersey. I drove down to Houston, got a job with Lockheed Martin, one of the contractors for NASA, and uh, working as an engineer on the space shuttle program. 
did that for a few years, and then they had another astronaut selection, sent my application in again, got called up for the medical tests and interviews, and this time I got a phone call back in the end, and they said, Don, are you still interested in being an astronaut? Because we'd like to offer you the job. And j just thank you. And just for the record, I said something really intelligent. I think my words were habada, 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 habada. I finally got the words yes out of my mouth. I hung up the phone, and I was screaming, jumping up and down, yelling uh, for 10 minutes because I knew I made it. I'm in. I was going into space one day. I didn't know when that would be, but I knew I was in line for that. And I started four years of training for my first mission. So I was 35 years old when I got that call from NASA and 39 the first time that I launched into space. And for your students, 39 is pretty much like an old man, right? But I, I like to remind them that some of the careers they're going to pick, it's going to take a while to get there. So I encourage them, don't give up on something because you think, well, that's too hard to do or I'd like to be a teacher, but I know that you know, takes a long time to get there. You know, I, I tell the students, if you've got this dream, if you've got this passion, if you're willing to work hard, you never give up, you can accomplish anything you want to in your lifetime. And I'm kind of living proof of that. I can't tell you what an amazing moment it was to finally feel the engines ignite on my first mission when I could feel the push in my back knowing that we had lifted off the launch pad. I had my helmet on, visor down. Nobody in the world could hear me as we lifted off the launch pad, and I'm screaming inside my helmet, Yahoo, let's go, because here was the dream of my life taking place right in front of my eyes, and it was such an incredible moment. It was worth all the effort that I had put into it a million times over. And eight and a half minutes later, the engine shut down, and I had made it to space. And the views of the Earth that we get to see from up there will take your breath away. I've been up there many times with first-time flyers on my missions, and it's pretty much the same routine for every astronaut. Even if you've seen these pictures in the IMAX movies, when you see the view out the window the first time, you just gasp. Oh, wow! You know, you say, oh, my God, how beautiful it is. And a, a couple things impressed me the most. One was how black the sky is. It's blacker than any color I've ever seen before. I've gone spelunking here in Huntsville. It's the spelunking capital of the world. And I've gone in caves, you turn off all the lights, it's pitch black. Looking at the sky in space is even blacker than that. It appeared to be almost like a fluorescent black, just glowing out there. And then right along the limb of the earth, you can see it a little bit in this picture, you see this little tiny thin blue ribbon. That's our atmosphere. And you see this perspective uh, of how thin our atmosphere is. And I don't know an astronaut who's come back after their missions and not been moved by how fragile our planet is and how we have to take better care of this place. Today, just a few miles from us you know, here where we're sitting right now at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, we have a new generation of scientists and engineers designing and building the space launch system that you see here. One version of these rockets will reach nearly 400 feet tall. Taller than the Saturn V, we're going to have dinner underneath. Taller than the Saturn V you see standing outside the doors here. And with these new rockets, we have incredible destinations in our targets. Maybe returning to the moon to build a lunar base like you see here. Maybe a mission to the asteroids that you see to explore these early remnants of our solar system. Maybe orbiting the planet Mars or landing on one of its moons. And hopefully 30 to 40 years from now, we hope to send astronauts from Earth to set foot on the planet Mars and walk on its surface. And it's my personal hope that that first crew that sets foot on Mars will be an international crew and truly represent all of us here on planet Earth. There are so many exciting missions and destinations out there for us to explore. And if we're ever going to get to Mars and these other destinations, we need each and every one of you teachers there to help us educate, inspire, and excite this next generation of scientists, engineers, and explorers. The generation that will be undertaking these missions that you see here, the missions of tomorrow, they're in your classrooms today. So the work you're doing today will have a tremendous impact on the success of these missions. I think you're all familiar with the phrase, I touch the, the future, I teach. Well, you are all helping to prepare this next generation, and when we land on Mars and go to some of these other destinations in the future, you will have played a significant role in making that happen. That is why we're so proud and pleased to have you here this week at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. So from all the astronauts and all of us here at Space Camp, 
We thank you for all you're doing. Keep your eyes on the stars. Have a lot of fun here this week and have a great uh, upcoming school year when you get back to your home areas. Thank you very much.